So many times I've questioned certain circumstances of things I could not understand. And many times in trials, weakness blurs my vision and my frustration gets so out of hand. But it's then I am reminded Oh, I have never been forsaken And I've never had to stand one test alone As I look at all the victories Oh, God's Spirit rises up in me And it's through the fire My weakness is made strong He never promised That the cross would not get heavy and the real would not be hard to find. He never offered our victories without fighting, but he said help would always come in time. Just remember when you're standing in the valley of decision, and the adversary says, Take you through that fire again. I know within myself that I would surely perish. Hey. Oh, but if I trust the mighty hand of God, He'll shield those flames again and again. He never promised that the cross would not get heavy. You would not be hard to climb. He never offered one victory without fighting. But he said it would always come in time. Just remember when you're standing in the valley of decision, and the adversary says, "Give in." Oh, Take you through that fire again And just hold on Our Lord will show up And He will take you through that fire again One night while on life's raging sea It looked as if I would suffer defeat As the darkness of night closed off the light My heart sank with fear And my desperate cry rang out with fright And all I could see was no hope inside With faith all but gone I met that one who came looking for me He came looking for me He came looking for me Oh, he made a way when there was no way that I could see When I drifted far, Jesus was near to rescue my soul and calm all my fear with faith all but gone I met that one who came looking for me the old Satan had already picked out my grave his plans had moved forward to put me away and I drifted so far oh would anyone care that I'd soon be lost 
destruction was a matter of time but Jesus appeared and said this one is mine we walked through that storm and I met that one who came looking for me he came looking for me oh he came looking for me and he made a way when there no way that I could see oh, when I drifted far Jesus was near to rescue my soul and calm all my fear with faith all but gone I met that one who came looking for me he came looking for me he came looking for me was near to rescue my soul and call on my fear with faith all but gone I met that one who came looking for me with faith all but gone with faith all but gone with faith all but gone I met that one who came looking for me Drifted far, Jesus was near to rescue my soul and calm all my fear. With faith all but gone, I met that one who came looking for me. Oh, yes, it is. Amen. 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 Am
Decided Amen, not to give us one but two, but I'm thankful sometimes I get frustrated with it. But I know something good's gonna come out of it, and I'm just glad He just continues to keep blessing me and Isaac. I don't I don't know what we've done or why He keeps being so good to us, but it's like every time we turn around and get discouraged, it's like here's another blessing, take it. But I'm just glad I'm so thankful. It 
And don't it make you want to go home? Run through those gates and fall in Jesus' arms. And the cares of this world will be gone. Don't it make, don't it make you want to go home? And don't it make, don't it make you want to go home? Come home, come home, it's supper time. The shadows lengthen fast. Come home, come home. It's supper time. We're going. Open your Bibles up tonight to 2 Peter chapter number 1. 2 Peter chapter number 1. 2 Peter chapter number 1. While you're turning there, I typically don't always do this, but I want to do it, but... um, I just want to say how thankful I am for my wife. We, uh, this past weekend, or last week, was able to go do that marriage conference. And believe it or not, the first session service that we had, believe it or not, you know, I did the preaching, but me and Tiffany actually had to pull this thing together. Now, I don't know how many of you understand, but that right there is a miracle within itself. Because she can't always put up with me. Somebody say amen. But I could not have been more proud. Uh, God used everything we did. I I was so much that, I mean, I'm telling you, we did this a couple years ago with our couples here. But I'm telling you, just like Brother Scotty had had preached that one, one night for our Valentine's thing, there's an importance in your marriage. And if your marriage is not important to keep together, it's important to the devil to separate it. Yes, and, uh, but I, I, I watched Tiffany, the, you know, it's one thing for you to hear what we say all the time. It's another thing to be able to take all that we have learned together as a couple. As a couple. Now listen, I did all the preaching. Don't get quiet on me. Okay? But, I could not have done what I'd done without my help me being there. She balanced it. Amen. She completed it. And not only that, but everything that we said was was exemplified just by what we had and had the best time. Almost, she almost she almost convinced me to try to have a little girl. (laughs) She did. They had this little baby up there. It's a little girl. Man, she was precious. And every time I turn around, Tiffany say, you want to hold the baby? 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 I'm like, good gracious, like a hot potato. But Tiffany just did a, a remarkable job. She spoke to the women on that evening, and I spoke to the men. And I told the men, I said, listen, you can listen to me, Hack. We were downstairs. They were upstairs. I said, y'all can listen to me, Hack, or y'all can listen to her, Hack. But one, just listen to somebody hacking, hey, amen. And, uh, but no, she did a tremendous job, and um, we had a good time. We had a really good time, did the love languages. Uh, I found out something I never knew. She just, she loves for people to buy her stuff. I'm glad somebody laughed, because I've always known that. How about we get up there, we did the five love languages, 
And we explained them, you know, mine's words of affirmation. I'm up there and said, this is where you say, you know, you did a good job, or I'm so proud of you, or thank you for making money, or just thank you for providing. You know, that's me, and I explained, if that's you, praise the Lord, raise your hand, they did it. She says, now how many of y'all have gifts? And nobody raised their hand. And Timothy says, well, mine's gifts, that's my love language. And she was the only one out of the whole bunch. And I thought, God help, I'm the only broke husband that's up here, Amen. <laughs> But we really had a good time, and um, we, when we left out, we went by the Apple Barn. <clears throat> y'all, some of y'all remember when we got married 10 years ago, uh, we went to Gatlinburg for our, our anniversary, and I'm um, a honeymoon, it was a honeymoon. And, uh, but when we left, you know, we was up there, we went to the Apple Barn. And, you know, I know that's simple to some of y'all. Man, I, hey, um, it's by God's grace that I, I made 10 years to go to Apple Barn again with her. Amen. I mean, seriously. Yeah, your counselor did okay. <laughs> uh, amen. But um, a lot of times, y'all see what I do, and you pray for me. But my greatest inspiration, other than the Lord, probably the one that knows as many tears to run down my face. My inadequacies, my fears. When I feeble as a man. At times when I, I want to just sit down and lay my head into her side. Tiffany is the most remarkable woman that I know. And I say this knowing that y'all knew who she was before she grew up, when she was a teenager. And I know she might have been feisty then, but she's an angel now. And the devil has fought harder than you could ever imagine. But she's helped me see when I couldn't see. And I know the Bible says in Peter 3 that a woman can win a man by our conversation. I know what the Bible's saying, but I'll say this too. That conversation could be prayer to a heavenly father. Yeah. Brother Shane, there have been many a times my wife's prayed for me. It's helped me go on and get past it. And I'm not, listen, I'm not praising her. And I know y'all love me and I know you love her. But if you only knew the hell that she's been through. And she still stands and she ministers to you singing. And you can lie to me all you want, but at times you can see the look on her face and the countenance and you can be judgmental. I know I've been there. But you don't know the baggage that's on her shoulders when she stands up here. You don't know the pastor that stands behind this pulpit that has emptied his heart into her mind before the night before he ever took the pulpit. And until you ever carry that load, the best thing you can do is pray and thank God for people like that. She's not perfect. <clears throat> Sometimes, but not all the time. 99% of the time, she's perfect. And I don't give her enough credit. I don't give her enough credit. I'd rather have my family than have a ministry. I'd rather have my wife and my son than have the biggest church in the world. I lose my confidence when her confidence is not what it needs to be. That's how much I depend upon my wife. And don't get quiet, because some of you men, like Shane Hatcher, you can't, go to, you can't go to church without your wife laying out your clothes. Amen. I don't need that. I don't need that help. But what I do need is somebody to, to help me when I'm down. And I'll tell you this. Thank God that we have wives, that Angie and Ashlyn and, and Miss Terry and all... They might be wonderful wives for you. 
But that's because God knew exactly what you needed, and you needed, and you needed. All her flaws has helped you as a man because you've owned them if you've been a a biblical husband. But all of her good things that seem to be shadowed has made you a better man for who you are. And all the feisty, rear back, and tell it how it is, call it out that my wife may be, and she can plow every now and then. I know, I know. But she's everything and more than I ever wanted and I thought God would give me. I'll never forget the day we got married. Brother Shane, you remember those double doors opened up and that silhouette of Tiffany. And she started singing that song, Imagine Me Without You. Sometimes I take my little boy down the road and I play that song. I say, your mama sang this to me when we got married. I want you to pray for her. I want you to pray for your family. I want you to love one another. And remember this, you could beat up on each other, but if you want that person that God gave you to last for a lifetime, you ought to take care of them. <laughs> Amen. And if that, if that means buy them a little something, then buy them a little something. Amen. I was kind of like that car. You ain't just going to neglect that car. You got to change the tires every now and again. Got to put gas in it. You're going to wash that baby every now and again. Can I get a witness? Amen. It's all right to do that for your wife. By the way, wives, it's all right to do that for your husband. Love on him. Amen. Quiet. I'm I'm not preaching that. I love on him. Some of you college and career, I'm saying this out of love. Statistically, marriages, one out of two are ending. You better start right now, not looking for the right one, but preparing yourself to be the right one for somebody else. Because if you wait till you get married, the odds are against you. Amen. Amen. Just everybody turn and kiss your wife. I'm just kidding. Don't do that. I will say this, and I'm going to read the text, and I'm not going to be long tonight. The other night I was preaching, Brother Shane, it was a marriage conference, okay? And I said, I've even learned it's all right to kiss my wife. And you believe it or not, I actually kissed my wife in public. I know it's all right. I'm married. Somebody say amen. If if my wife would have kissed another man, I'd have punched him in the nose. If I was kissed no one, she'd punch me and you in the nose. Oh, me. I want to help you tonight, and um, this is probably a very deep thing, <clears throat> but I, uh, I want to share something. I want to be a help to you, and I'll, I'll mind the time if I can. First Peter chapter number one, I'm second Peter chapter number one, I want to read just a few verses, and I want to give you a little bit of introduction We're going to start reading to verse number 16 tonight, so stay with me for just one second. For we have not followed cunningly, devised devised fables, when we were made known unto you the power of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of His majesty. Now, I know some of you thought that makes no sense to me. Peter's talking about the Mount of Transfiguration. He's in a place here where he is now beginning to explain some things that he learned. And the Bible says in verse number 17, For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him in the excellent glory, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount, the mount of transfiguration. The Bible says we have also a more sure word, understand that, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, the prophecy of the Scripture, you better nail this down because people's attacking it everywhere, 
The prophecy of this scripture is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. But holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. You want to know why why that's important? Because your King James Bible's under attack, saying, well, how do you know if that's right? Because if men are sinful, then how in the world could you have the Word of God to be preserved? So you better understand that you know why you believe what you believe. What I want to share with you tonight is not that thought. It's the principle that you find in verses 16 through 18 where Peter comes back to a place that he is actually coming up and he is talking about, remembering, if you will, the the mountain experience with God. And he begins to talk about when, when Peter, James, and John had went up and Moses and Elijah had met them and they came to a place where literally Jesus had sat down in the middle of them. If I was to give you a picture this evening, what it was, it's the Old Testament and the New Testament and then the living Word coming together in an experience that you could never understand. And what Peter was saying is, I want you, though I have seen with my own eyes, Though he has seen with his own eyes. Do you understand what it must have been like to be on the Mount of Transfiguration? Do you understand how glorious it must have been? The revival experience, the power of God, and the presence of God that sat down in the middle of that. It would amaze you to see that. Peter said, notice the Bible says there in that verse number 19, we have also a more sure Word of prophecy. He said, I want you to know more than I know, and I've seen it myself. Now, I'm going to take this deep thought, and I'm going to make it very shallow for a lot of us, and this is pretty much the thought that he's given. That he says, I had a mountain experience that changed my life. He said, I had a mountain experience that done something for me that I never thought could ever happen. I had a mountain experience where God changed my life forever. He said, but I want you to have a more sure prophecy than what I've even seen. And it's by the inherited, infallible Word of God. You want a mountain experience? Revival is three weekends away. Kenny Baldwin can't bring it. Brent Clark can't pack it in a suitcase. The choirs ain't going to bring it with the kids and all the food that come with it. It's not going to be by the pews being filled and the people walking up and down the aisles and shouting and raising their hand and saying amen. The only way for you to ever get a revival experience is to humble yourself and do what the Bible says and let the living word meet the written word and you can have a mountain experience just like he did. But until you dive into what God says, God will never do what God promised. We want God to do something. We want the mountaintop experience. We want to experience God, see God like we've never seen God. We want to be like Peter, James, and John, but we never get in the Bible. There's some of you kids go to Christian school, you don't even read your Bible to study for Christian school. All you do is look it up on Facebook, look it up on Google. You'll ask somebody else or you'll do something there. I'm just being honest with you. And you want to know why they don't? Because they go to a Christian school and we think they all do it. But because you go to a Christian church and you're a mom and dad, they don't ever see you do it. Amen. Hey man, preach on, preacher, preach on. You don't know why our kids don't know how to get the power of God out of the Word of God? Because they ain't never seen somebody hook up to that gas station and get filled up the right way. We want it in a song. We want it in a sermon. We want it in a preacher. We want an experience where people come in here. The Bible says there's one way and it's by the Word of God. That book that's in your hand, if you're holding one, it ought to be the most precious thing in your life other than your salvation. You say what my family is. Well, let me just say this. You want to be a good husband, be a good wife, be a good daddy. You want to be a good child, good teenager, good young man. Hey, you're not going to be what you need to be until you get in the Word of God. Amen. That's where it says, you see, he comes out of this, and you know why he does it? Because he just finished talking about growing. 
And when he got talking about growing, notice the text. The Bible says, when you look back up in there, it says there are those verses that he talks about them being at a place to where they don't know how to grow. In verse number, verse number uh, 9, he says, But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and forgot that he was purged from his old sins. He's talking about growing in the Lord. Growing. Kids today don't know if they're saved or not. They ain't got the first clue. But they know they prayed a prayer somewhere. Let me say this with all due respect. I hope my little boy knows more than the day that he got saved. I hope he knows for the change that was in his life that he remembered that Jesus took away his sins. I didn't want to be just a knowledge thing. I didn't want to just be a prayer thing. I want him to understand that he has grown by living for God. and He's grown by learning for God and doing the things that he ought to do by listening to God. Hey, but if they ever get to a place to where you stop growing, the Bible says you will tell your salvation. Do you know tonight that you're saved by the grace of God? Do you know that Jesus Christ is your Lord? Do you know that God is your Father? And does your life show that? Because you could claim it, but the question is, do you live it? And if you don't live it, is it true? Are you willing to die and go to hell because of a profession that was made and all it was was a profession you just knew what the Bible says but you got to the place today that you just don't know anymore well it's one of two things if you don't know anymore either you ain't saved Amen. you listen to me with the greatest plea that I can get and I'm begging you you will die and go to hell tonight by playing the game of unknown salvation right. eternity is forever that girlfriend boyfriend that friend that job that social activity it is a temporal thing but we're talking about eternity i'd rather know that i'm saved by the grace of god and have it written down than think about it or hope so the bible says if you ain't saved then you're lost but he says this if you're doubting it tonight it might be because listen You've never grown the way you should. If you read that text, what he's saying there is, he starts off, add to your faith, virtue, virtue, knowledge, knowledge, temperance. Verse number five. Verse number six, he says, temperance, patience, patience, godliness, godliness, brotherly kindness, brotherly kindness, charity. And if these things be in you and abound, he says, that they may make, make that you that you shall never be barren nor unfruitful. Can I ask you a question tonight? Do you got any fruit that says that you're saved? Does your Facebook even say you're saved? Does the phones on your iPod say you're saved? Does the phone that's in, in your car and the text message say you're saved? Is the radio station in your car say you're saved? Is the things that nobody see say you're saved? What about the way you dress? Does it say you're saved? What about your friends? Does it say you're saved? What about your boyfriend? Oh yeah, everybody likes him. No wonder. Because he's the man of the hour for everybody else. I guess you just took a number and want to be treated like an old dirty towel. I'll say amen right there. What about that girl? Oh, that's fine. It'll be all right. I wonder if the girl you hold hands with, does she say you're saved? Oh, yes. Does it say you're saved? You say, no, that's not Bible. That's judging. It said fruitfulness. Fruitfulness. Does the, does the preacher got to get you wound up to get you wound up for Jesus? Must the preacher clap his hands to get you to pay attention in church? Does he have to say get off of your cell phone on the back row before you get off of your cell phone on the back row? Preach on, preacher, preach on. Amen. It's fruitfulness. Yes. And I'm standing in the gap as a pastor not wanting you to die and go to hell. Pour my heart out. Teachers pour their heart out. Mom and daddies pour their heart out. They bring you to church, youth activities. They bring you to conference. Mom and daddies come and sing the choir. Well, I thank God for the day that Brother Samuel Grubbs got saved. Man lived in church, raised in church. He come to church, brought his family to church. His wife loved church. His kids loved church. But thank God he realized all he had was church. He walked the aisle and got glorious saved by the grace of God. And thank God he's got a no-so salvation. Add your faith virtue. You say, well, I'm adding my salvation. That's not what the Bible's saying. He's saying grow. You need to grow. You need to grow. You need to grow. 
You need to grow. Hey, you Christian school kids, you're not in Christian school just to go to Christian school. You're there to grow. How much more Bible do you know? And I'm not talking about education. I'm talking about by intimacy. Yes, sir. Intimacy. Yes, sir. Intimacy. There's people that come to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, never revival meeting and serving every capacity. And they ain't got no more God on them living the right way than the people that's walking in off the street. You know why? Because they got a daily walk with God and all we do is come to church. It's routine, my friend. Routine, my friend. Why must somebody ask you to give to the Lord? Why must somebody ask you to be faithful to the house of God? Why must somebody ask you to pray for you come to church? Why must somebody ask you to be able to do right, act right, speak right, hold yourself upright, live for God, and respect the house of God? God forbid we can't even keep our children accountable for that anymore. Let me tell you something. Most holy place there is in this world is the church of my book to my son and my wife. Amen. You walk in here. You know, I, I'm going to park here. I'm sorry. I, 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 and God forbid, it ain't just a place that we come. Man, this is a place that some of them come meet and hook up. I'm telling you, you know I am. Sean knows he's been up there with me. I mean, I'm talking about, man, they can hide out in the dark places. They know the places to go. And you almost got to lock every door in the church to be able to keep it. There's no respect or reverence for the house of God. They'll cuss and fuss and throw rocks around the place. Hey, listen, don't be good all the kids and making them at blame for everything because they got a mom and daddy's got to give an account for it. Amen. Amen. I'm talking about growing, growing. Why must we have to ask somebody to do something for God? Why must somebody have to do it? You say, that's none of your business. It ain't none of my business. But if the same God that I know that saved me, saved you, and He's that good, how come you still the same way as you was six months ago? I'm in a dry place. And I'm not speaking to the one I spoke to earlier. Sometimes the dry place is not because God's teaching. It's because you're too hard-headed and you got unconfessed sin. God won't let you get out of there. Hey, man. I'm not talking to the person I talked to earlier. They know who they are. Let me tell you what the Bible says here. I'm talking about an experience, having a mountaintop experience. Listen to me. This is why I'm so burdened for it. He says here that you can come to the place that you can actually see God. Verse number 19. He says here that we also have this more sure of a prophecy wherein too you do well that you take heed. Listen to this. As a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts. He's talking about the, the day star. What's the day star? The day star is the sun. It's the light that removes the darkness. Do you know what the light is that removes the darkness for us? It's Jesus Christ. Listen, I'm trying to help you tonight. And I mean, I know I've been blunt and I've been plain, but we need it. Amen. We need it. Amen. Yes, it's a dark world. These kids over here, it's a dark world. We act like we know. We don't know how hard it is. I'm not preaching down to anybody tonight. I know these kids right here in the middle, it, it's hard. It's hard to live right. It's hard. Dealing with scars and pain in the past. Not knowing who to trust, who to love, who loves you. Hey, because the people who are supposed to love you has turned you away. You don't know if God's love's always real and always... I mean, it's hard. But listen to what he's telling you. Listen to me. Mr. Ever, will you come? Just go ahead and come. Keep your Bible open. Listen to me. Whether you're a teenager, a mom, a dad, a senior saint, whoever, listen to me. He's saying to you tonight you can have the confidence of the Lord Himself, experience Him the way He did, when you get in the Bible and you allow the living Word meet you as you take the written Word. He says there in that text that pretty much He's the day star that He comes. I'm not going to read it. We're Revelations chapter number 22, verse number 16. He says that He is the bright morning star. You know what you and I need more than we need this Bible? We need the Holy Ghost Himself to intervene and teach us what he wants to teach us as we read this word. If not, it's an education. It's an education. It's an education. You know, I try to break it down, break it down, break it down because of all these kids. They don't understand all that. But you know what they do understand? They understand that I can be humble enough to say, I don't know how hard it is to live right, but I know it's difficult. But I want you to know that even though I don't see where you are, I know the path that God gives is faithful for everybody. And if you live by this Bible, there's hope. 
there's hope. If you'll stay in this book, there's hope. There's hope. You want to know why you don't have a lot of hope? Because the light you're living by is not the light of Christ, it's the darkness of the world. Your hope is by the friends that you have in the world and not the friend you have in Jesus. I'm not hurting you, I'm helping you tonight. You want to know why the odds are against you and the statistics are the way they are and you don't see the way out? Because all your advice and the person you lean on is the world, it's not Christ. He's saying when you live upon the Word of God and you do what's right, there is a light that shines in the darkness. And thank God for the light of Jesus Christ. He says after that, notice this right here if you will. He says right after that, he says that you have a what? A more sure word. In other words, there's an experience that is defined by the Lord Jesus, but there's also experience that is deeper. He's saying, believe it or not, that if you stay in the Word and you live and let Jesus Christ, listen to me, you let Jesus Christ intervene in your daily walk, He said you'll experience more than what He experienced on the Mount of Transfiguration. A more sure Word. He says, you don't need my experience. You need your own experience. Everybody with me? Say amen. I tell you, I tell y'all, y'all don't need to know my story. You need your own story. All right, Brother Isaac, he don't, he don't just need me to get up here. He needs his own story. You know where he gets it? He gets it right here in the Word of God. Amen. Next thing I would say to you about getting that mountain experience with this is you experience in the dark. In other words, here's the thing. Sometimes it's the dark places where you find the most light. I'm going to be out front with you. It is in the dark times of my life where I find myself planted in this Word more than I've ever been before. Can I ask you a question? How much darkness, and I'm trying, I, I feel like I'm talking to somebody, but I got to get you to shift gears and not think that I've, I'm trying to be calling every. I'm not calling nobody. I gotta, y'all know me. I got a humble heart. I'm not, I'm not that way. But I wonder who's in here tonight. And, man, you just can't get past what you're facing. You can't get past what you're facing. And it seems to be dark. It seems to be dreary. It seems to be a situation that you just don't know what to do. And you're in the middle of that darkness. And you're trying to find a way out. And can I tell you something? God don't ever have two doors. He says, I am the way, the truth. There is one way. And it's Jesus. Yeah, but if I do this, God understands. No, God don't understand. God wants obedience. I'm trying to help you tonight. God wants obedience. You know why you're still in that dark place? It's because you hadn't found the light. You haven't gotten the Word. You say, Brother Jason, I don't know how to look for it. Listen, don't tell me that. That's all I've ever known to teach me. Amen. I I ain't got a Bible college degree. There's been a couple times, maybe 10 times, I've called Brother Larry over 13 years. Say, what do you think about this, Brother Larry? You you know what I've had to have? The Holy Ghost teach me. I didn't have a mom and daddy to raise me in church. I didn't have somebody just to, to take and teach me. The Holy Ghost himself, Jesus had to get in the middle of what I was doing for me to learn. Raised in a drunkard home. Mom and daddy split up. My aunt had to raise me. I had no hope. I was 23 years old. Made a false profession when I was 15. And I was dying and going to hell. And I was wondering why I was still doing the same things. Acting the same way. Saying the same things. I was still bitter, mad, and upset. And I was wondering why in the world can I not get past this. It was because I was lost. But when I met Jesus. And he passed by my way. Listen, he gave me a promise to never leave me nor forsake me. He told me he'd love me no matter what I ever went through. And there's been times I felt like the greatest dummy when I sat down in that Bible and said, Lord, I don't know how to be a preacher. God, I don't know how to be a good husband. I don't know how to be a daddy. I can't be a pastor. I'm not qualified. And it seemed like Jesus himself come down 
and the living word, and the written word. And man, I got a more sure word. Thank God for what the Lord did for Peter, James, and John. But I wasn't there, honey. But I can tell you the day I got saved. I can tell you what God called me to preach. And I'm so thankful that I know what God's done in my life. The last thing, and I'm done. He says there, notice this. He says there ought to be an experience that's by discipline. I need to say this to you because there's going to come a time when you're going to doubt it. Verses 20 and 21. I'm talking about having a mountaintop experience. It might be deep. It might be dark. And it's defined. But you better be disciplined in that experience because there's going to be times that the world's going to try to get you to waver from what you believe. And it's found in verses 20 and 21. Listen. If you don't have the confidence that the Word of God is pure and right and infallible and it's inherited and you don't believe that it's preserved, I'm telling you something, the devil's going to get you defeated. The devil's going to get you defeated because there ain't a preacher that I know, though there's a lot of good ones, and I'll take every word, but I'm going to say this, I'll go on record saying God's Word ain't never failed me. God's Word's never failed me. And at times when people told me I was crazy for doing what I was doing, there was something in that Bible, Brother Sean, that I could say right here, God told me I better do that right there. And nobody understand. You know why it mattered? Because I had a pretty wife that depended on me listening to God. I had a nine-year-old boy that was looking to his daddy to make sure it was all right. And what you don't understand, the Bible says the Holy... The the Holy Ghost spoke to the men. See, what you don't understand, it wasn't them men wrote it down. No, no, no. It's kind of like a sail, if you will. You look it up in the Greek. In other words, they set the sail and it was the wind that actually blew what it was doing. The Holy Ghost moved upon the men. It was sent by, it was sent by God. Though it was through wicked, carnal, sinful men, it was the exact thing that was needed to be kept and preserved for you and I to have the Word of God. You believe that? Say amen. Now let me say this to you. You say, well, how how can the Bible be so right written by men that are so sinful? There was a lady by the name of Mary. She was a sinner. And the Holy Ghost moved upon the very seed that was fertilized for that lady. God Himself moved in and Jesus Christ, the Holy Ghost, protected the very thing that kept her, uh, even though she was a virgin, but yet she was sinful, she was a sinner, but yet though it had the very humanity of man in it, it was still the sinless Son of God. And if God could use a sinful woman to birth the sinless Son of God. Don't you think God can use sin, sinful man and write the Holy Word of God? I'll tell you why I say it. This is all I got. It's all I got. Every record, every home run I've ever hit, everything I've ever accomplished, every A I've ever made, every friend I've ever had, every girl I ever dated before the person that God gave me. It's all in vain. I'm not trying to be silly. This right here has helped me. There's been times that I have got down in my study and told God that He's got to tell me what to do because I am clueless. I didn't have, and thank God for good deacons, I didn't have deacons to tell me the way my preacher thank God for a good pastor he didn't he couldn't tell me the way thank God for a good wife she could tell me but the Holy Ghost himself let me tell y'all something these kids I don't know you our boys I don't know you you better take the best advice I can tell you if I told you I got a place you could go to right now make a million dollars when you graduate high school you'd probably go you'd probably go well, let me tell you this I'm not crazy and we're all de- diverse and we all come from different areas Boys, this is serious. This better be your roadmap. This better be your roadmap. Young couples, Daniel, Ashley, some of the others getting married soon. This better be your roadmap. Because this preacher's going to fail you. But this Bible won't. This 
Bible one. Here's the invitation. You really want a mountaintop experience? You want God to make a change in your life like He did for Peter that day? He says, this is all you need. I want to invite you to be able to come. And I hope you know my heart. I want to stand in the gap. I don't want you to go to hell. I'm not trying to belittle nobody. I'm not trying to call your sin out. Listen, your sin's different than mine, but it's still sin. If you're here tonight, you're doubting your salvation. Maybe you're lost. I want to tell you, based upon the authority of the Word of God, God will save you. He's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. Father, we love you. And Lord, we thank you for what you're doing. God, help us to understand the mountaintop experiences are not necessarily the people we know. It's not even in the times we go to church. It's not in how faithful our Sunday school attendance is. It's not our friendships. It's not our family. It's not even in our ministry. It's only found in the Word of God. Inspired, interpreted by the Holy Spirit of God. God, I pray that tonight that we would trust in you in Jesus' name. It's about now. As the pastor, I want to thank you for viewing our video today. However, if God's dealt with your heart, we do not want to end this video without giving you a chance to be able to accept Jesus Christ as a personal Savior. If you're there today and God's actually dealing with your heart, I want to remind you what the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That means every single one of us has had problems, issues, sin, failures, faults in our past. But the great thing is this, is that Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man coming through the Father but by me. There is a way to be able to have hope, to have eternal security within the Lord Jesus Christ, to be able to know that you're saved by the grace of God. Now the great thing about the Bible is it tells us about the love of God. He says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And that's amazing to a lot of people, and they can quote it. But the beauty of it is this, is the very next verse tells us the purpose of Christ. Because the Bible says, For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, that the world through Him might be saved. That means that God sent His Son to die for those of us who are sinners so that we can have fellowship with God Himself. Now, if you're there today and God's really been dealing with your heart, I want to ask you this question. Do you really believe that God's been dealing with you about salvation? If that's the case today, then I want to tell you what you need to do is repent of your sins. You need to die to yourself. Admit that you're lost and you're on your way to hell. And then look at what the Bible tells us, that He tells us that we can be saved through Christ. Who do you call on? There's only one. As the Bible says, neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It's only through Christ and Christ alone. So I tell you today, would you trust in Christ? When I ask you, would you, would you trust in Him as a personal Savior? You say, Brother Jason, I don't really know if I can do that. Well, let me tell you, the Bible also tells us that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It don't matter who you are, where you come from, God sent His Son to die for everyone. If you've made this decision today to be able to trust in Christ, to be able to die to yourself, to, to be able to start living for Christ and accept Him as a personal Savior after repenting, would you do us a favor and be able to contact us at 336-788-0551 and let us know about this decision that you made so we can start praying for you. Thank you so much.